I've got to talk fast because I don't want to try to compete with Brother Otis. I heard he went over 15 minutes last Sunday. And, and I, don't want to, I don't want anybody to think I'm trying to outdo Brother Otis. But we're going to be in Revelation chapter 3 today. So if you have your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 3. And I'm going to be talking about um, prophecy and denomination. Now, you've heard me say a bunch of times about how I was baptized in the Church of Christ and how I was raised Baptist and went to Pentecostal churches and even been to Jewish synagogues. Um, there's over 33,000 Christian religions. I don't know if you all know that. Uh, and you got to ask yourself, you know, with all these different religions, and I'm not talking about Muslims, I'm not talking about, you know, the, the other religions in other countries. I'm talking about just Christian religions. There's over 33,000 of them. And I know for a fact that nobody has it completely right. Does anybody believe that anyone has it completely right? No. So I'm going to say this before I get really into it. I love y'all with all my heart. Okay? But there's something really important. Now, I'm going to use the word scary only because it's revelation and we expect that word. But actually, I don't mean scary. What I mean is uh, you could replace that with interesting. So if you hear me say that's scary, I only mean that it's interesting or that it's a, a, got a wow factor to it because Christians don't have to worry about revelation. All revelation is is Jesus Christ speaking to the Christian, okay? I mean, that's, that's all it is. He's speaking about the things that will happen, all right? And all of the stuff for the, for the, for the Christian is good. But we have all these denominations. And, and I thought to myself, you know what? God had a plan for my life. And, and he might take me away from these three churches. But it, it, it doesn't strike me as coincidence that I went through so many denominations in my life. And I got churches with a lot of denominations in them. And, and it's not just Oak Hill. Because Shiloh, the smallest of the three churches, have Catholic, have Baptist, and have Methodist all in that church. The piano player who's been there, I guess, for better part of... Of 15, 20 years doesn't even belong to Shiloh. She's a Baptist and she's got a membership in another church. Um, Vicki Muscle's Catholic. Um, and I know that we've got Catholic here, we've got uh, Baptist, we've got Cumberland Presbyterian, we've got Methodist. So the question is, what does God want? Right? Uh, I bring this up because Revelation chapter 3 is the last chapter before the winds of strife. It's, it's the chapter where Jesus talks to the churches, and then everything starts to unfold. Now, before I get into chapter 3, I want to let you in on a few things. Now, one, we all know that people have been preaching into the world for a long time, haven't they? So long and so much that we're tired of it, <coughs> that we're complacent with it, and every time we hear it, we think, yeah, okay, whatever, they've been saying that for a long time. But you know what? There was a warning given to Sodom and Gomorrah, too, wasn't there? And, and I'm sure they went up to Noah and said, you know what, you've been building this ark for a long time, Noah, and we're getting tired of hearing about the end of the world, but it did come, and revelation will come. Now, I don't care about wars and rumors of wars. Uh, you know what, I think they said, what, in the whole history of the world, there's only been like 2,500 years where there wasn't a war? And I don't care about the floods, and I don't care about the earthquakes, because if you really went back in time, you could see where there was probably 100 earthquakes and 100 typhoons in one year and nothing for 20 years. And then you'd have a bunch more. And then you'd have a time where there was a bunch and then nothing for a short time. So Jesus said, you know, these things are going to happen. Don't let them bother you. But what do we need to let bother us? Well, should you be afraid of... of uh, Satan and the mark of the beast and the beast himself and the dragon? Well, are you afraid of being lost in space? Because if you're a Christian, you don't have to be any more afraid of the mark of the beast or Satan or the beast or the dragon any more than you need to do to be lost in space. Do you need to be worried about water being contaminated? Sure you do. With all the pollution and all the things that are going in, we're buying bottled water more and more. Why? Because that has something to do with us. There's a chance that we could go somewhere and get contaminated water. Who's been to Mexico? There's a chance, ain't there? There's a chance right here. Well, guess what? Jesus warns us about the things that we need to be warned about. And remember, Jesus speaks to the Christian, 
Okay? Now, there is a part in Revelation chapter 3 that I'm going to read where he talks about those that say they're Christian and not. And people will argue with me and say, well, that's who Jesus is really talking to when he's talking about punishment. No, he's not. Because he makes it a point to say that they are the synagogue of Satan. In other words, I'm not talking to them, okay? I'm not talking to the people that think they're Christians or say they're Christians and not. I'm talking to you, the Christian. And you need to keep that in mind. And, and, and I'm going to be very serious about this message, more than probably anyone that I've ever been serious about. And you'll see why here in a minute. Um, so, does God want all these denominations? Yes, He does. Now, I've said it before, if you want to rock and roll, there's a rock and roll church. If you want to be real silent, there's a silent church. There's no excuse not to go to church. That's one of the reasons why God wanted different denominations to fit the different personalities of people. But what about the real big reason? What happens in Revelation? How does the beast, how does Satan take over the world? How does he get everyone to worship him? One religion, right? If you think about it, every time that there was a, a king appointed to Israel, if it said, and he did which was right in the eyes of God, then everybody pretty much followed suit, didn't they, John? They pretty much followed suit. Now, there's an exception to every rule. There's an exception in Revelation. Jesus said there's but a few that are righteous. But every time there was one that didn't do good in the sight of God, it seemed like everybody else followed. Why does God want a lot of them denominations? Because when you got one denomination, you got one leader, and it depends on that leader on what everybody else is going to do. Amen? Sure. We can understand that. So how is Satan, because we're going to talk about Revelation and Satan and taking over the world and all this other stuff. How's he going to do it? You think he's going to force us to do it? He's been doing that for, for thousands of years, hasn't he? Christians being killed, being tortured. How many of y'all remember that, that uh, uh, woman that was over in one of the other countries and she was pregnant and they put her in jail for a while and they said they were going to kill her. Remember that? And her husband was over in America and she wouldn't deny Christ. How many of y'all think that a Christian might be killed today by ISIS? Pretty good chance of it, ain't there? So Satan's not going to do that. He's going to allow it to happen because he hates humanity. But more than that, he wants to be worshipped by humanity. And that's the whole purpose of Revelation. That's the whole purpose of Armageddon. He tried to battle God in heaven so that he could take his place to be worshipped. He tried to get Jesus to worship him when he, when he, when he uh, 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 tried to tempt him in the desert. And he's going to try to get the world to worship him by trying to conquer God one more time. Now, I'm going to do something that some of y'all are not going to like. But if you'll bear with me, you'll understand what I'm talking about, okay? How many of y'all have heard this big love revolution going on right now? Everything's about love. You hear these people that they'll get into a rap song and they'll, they'll call women hoes and bees and use the MF word and the GD word and all sorts of stuff. But then they'll talk to them and they'll say, oh, it's all about love. You know, it, we just need to love one another. Okay, fine. But I don't believe that. I believe that Satan is a counterfeit God and he's going to use a counterfeit love. He's going to use God's word to try to deceive us. You've heard that preach before too, haven't you? Okay, well, I'm going to tell you something that you probably don't know. Maybe you do know. If you do know, then maybe your eyes will be enlightened even more. <clears throat> I'm going to pick on the Pope. But before I do, I want you all to know that I do not believe that the Pope is the Antichrist. Okay? I'm talking about times right now. I'm not talking about people. I believe there are Catholics in heaven, and I believe there's going to be more Catholics in heaven. I believe that uh, Mother Mary, above all the people... Is, is in heaven, okay? Um, <clears throat> but, I'm going to pick on the Pope because he's done some things that have opened up the book of Revelation. And I'm not talking about wars and rumors of wars, and I'm not talking about earthquakes and all these other things. I'm talking about the real deal. I'm talking about pulling up uh, pages. We're really close to Revelation chapter 4. When the winds of strife are let loose. <clears throat> Before I go into this, I want to ask you this question. Who is the first pope of the Catholic Church? Peter. Ask any, you know, cardinal, bishop, the pope. So who was the very first pope of the Catholic Church? And they'll say Peter was the very first pope. They recognize Peter as the very first pope because Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. Amen. Now, if, if Satan can use Peter against Christ, 
the first pope, can, can you use the last pope against Christ? Now don't get me wrong. He's used evangelists, he's used Baptists, he's used Methodists, he's used a lot of people against God. But let me ask you this question. If you were Satan and you wanted to take over the world's religions and bring it under one power, would you go to the smallest denomination or the largest denomination? If I were walked in here and asked each and every one of you, I said, who do you think the biggest religious figure in the world is? About every one of you would say the Pope. He is recognized by all denominations as the, the biggest religious figure. There again, I'm not saying that the Pope is the Antichrist. I believe that the Pope loves Jesus Christ. And from what I've heard him say, I believe that everything he's doing, he's doing it out of love. But remember, Satan whispered in Peter's ear and said, Don't let him be crucified. You love him too much. Right? If he can use Peter... He can use this Pope here. But I want you to understand there's a lot of things that are happening now in the last two years that have never, ever happened before. Now, we all know about the government's decisions lately, don't we? About how the government's gone. I've got a letter in the mail from the United Methodist Church. I sat here and talked with Brother Jimmy Carter in the corner. I said, did you get that letter? He said, yeah. I said, it's on to me like what they're trying to say. Uh, to show our love for humanity that we need to allow homosexual pastors and, and homosexual marriage and things like that. He said, that's exactly what I get from that letter. So, whether you agree with that or not is beside the point. You can see how the world is going. But let me show you what the Pope has done in the last two years. Keeping in mind, I believe what he's doing is out of love. But I believe that Satan is using him to open up the pages of Revelation. The Pope talked with the United Nations last year. I believe it was last year. He had been Pope long, remember? That's another thing. There are two Popes right now. Did you notice that? <laughs> popes died, they get a new, new Pope. This time a Pope retired and they got another Pope. You've got two living Popes right now. But the Pope went to the United Nations and discussed the world's economy and told them how he thought that the money should be spent. How to use the world's money. Okay? And there again, he, his, his philosophy on what he was doing was right. I agree with it. The Pope met with Jews, Muslims, and Protestants in Israel at the Wailing Wall to try to unite the religions. That's not a bad thing, is it? He got all the great evangelists like Joel Olstein and all these pastors in these mega church and brought them to the Vatican and had a three-hour private meeting with them. He arranged Middle East peace talks at the Vatican and brought the president of Palestine and the president of Israel there to discuss peace between the nations. What does the Bible say he's going to do? He's going to say peace, but where you see peace, there's going to be a war again. On July 22nd, he organized a commission to promote worldwide Christianity. Now, all these things are great, aren't they not? It's not like he's out to kill anybody, is he? On August 22nd, 2014, the Pope approved the use of military force. Have y'all ever heard of the Pope approving the use of military force? I haven't. On September 4th, the Pope asked if he could be head of the United Religions Organizations. On October 27th, October 27th, the Pope declared faith in the Big Bang Theory and evolution. He said that it was true. He asked all Christians to have solidarity with Islam. And he wants you to use friendship and respect is that solidarity. So I don't know if you can grasp what I'm telling you here, but he's, he's also went before the joint sessions of Congress. So he has embarked on a military allegiance. He has embarked on an economical allegiance with the world. And he has embarked on a uh, one world religion. And like I said, I'm not saying that that's 
his agenda. But do you see the pages of Revelation opening up? Because if you don't, you're being fooled. And you need to pay attention to what's going on. And it's not just the Pope. Every single one of them evangelists, every Joel Osteen, all of them said he's right in everything he's doing. And like I said, a lot of what he's doing, and the reason why he's doing it, I agree with. But still, a one world religion, a one world economy, a one world military, and a one world political policy. Now, before we get into Revelation, I want to tell you that there's three types of people that believe Revelation in three different ways. One, you have them that say that, well, everything has already happened. The first century, everything in Revelation already happened, and that Nero was the Antichrist. Y'all know that the word Antichrist isn't mentioned in Revelation, right? There's a reason for that. Because there's a lot of Antichrists. There's only one Satan, one beast, one mark, but there's a lot of Antichrists. I believe Nero was. I believe Hitler was, Stalin, Mussolini. Anybody that has tried to kill millions of people because of hatred toward humanity and Christians and Jews, they are Antichrist. Can anybody believe, believe that? Does anybody agree with me? Everybody's sitting there dumbfounded and looking at us like, oh, wait, come on. If, if, if you're following me, say amen every once in a while, okay? Amen. I knew I could count on John. Um, but the second group are those that believe that everything that happened in the first three chapters of Revelation were happening at that time. And that after chapter 3, after that period of time was over, when John was caught up to heaven, and that the church will be caught up before the winds of strife, before the plagues are released, before Armageddon and all these other things uh, happen. And I don't know how you uh, believe, but I'm going to have to disagree with you because that's not what the Bible teaches. People say, well, you don't see the church after 4 after the, the fourth uh, chapter. You get, well, you see Christian, you see saint, and you see the body of Christ, but you don't see church. And the reason why you don't see church is because in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus speaks to three churches. Is anybody familiar with that, Revelation 3? He speaks to three churches. That's one of the reasons why I gave you that paper, so you know what numbers mean. Okay? Three means complete. This means that Jesus is speaking to every church and every denomination in the world. And he's giving this message to every church and every denomination. After chapter 3, when everything breaks loose, there won't be Baptists. There won't be uh, covenant Presbyterian Methodists. It's going to be Satan's followers and the Christians. Amen? Those that follow Christ. So as far as the denomination goes, there won't be. But as far as the body of Christ, there will be. Um, it says, uh, I guess I should have already got to Revelation, shouldn't I? Because I didn't have this one written down. I don't think it did. I might. Revelation chapter 13. Now, this is long after chapter 3. Verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Saints. It doesn't say church, but it says saints. It's talking about the saints. Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he who watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Remember, this is Jesus himself saying, I have not come yet, but you better keep an eye out for me. And this is after the sixth plague. What's the seventh? Jesus coming. Not our plague, but the sinner's plague. Amen? Now, it, it, it's a little complicated, Revelation is. And the reason for that is because, well, let me put this, God don't, like, God don't like slavery. He never did. Did he, John? Did he? He never, he never wanted slavery. But he knew that if he said, you'll not have a slave, that they would have done it anyways. So, lesser of two evils, ain't it, Rose? Well, treat them right. Treat them with respect. You know, treat them, treat them well. After six years, let them go free. You know, all these things. Women were treated terribly. Did God want that? If he did, then why did he uh, have Dorcas as a disciple and so many other disciples that are women? Why did he honor women with, with the birth of Jesus Christ? You know, Jesus said that God could raise up stones, didn't he? As descendants of Abraham. So God could have created Jesus just like he did Adam and Eve, couldn't he, John? He chose a woman. 
Ladies, God loves you. Everybody here, if God is with you, you're a majority. Amen? If God be for me, who could be against me? So anyways, you have all these things that are going on. Christians are being persecuted. Does God want that? No. So just like in World War II when they had codes, the chicken is in the pot. You know, the, the, the turtle has its shell. You know, when people come to read these things, they're like, what does this mean? A Christian say, I don't know, you tell me. You know, a lot less likely to be uh, crucified, a lot less likely to be tortured if no one knew how to interpret it. But we know because of Matthew chapter 13, 10 and 11, it says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Jesus, why speak of thou in the parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Amen? Have y'all followed me so far? You can understand Revelation merely by reading all the books before Revelation. Revelation is not the scary book. Every book before Revelation is a scary book. Okay? Revelation is a wonderful, beautiful book that reveals Jesus Christ to his saints. Why? Because Jesus came to this earth to show us who God was, and now he's using Revelation to show us who he is. Amen? So, knowing this, let's go over the uh, numerical page here real quick. One represents absolute singleness and unity. Two represents the truth of God's word. What did God say? If two or more are gathered in my name, amen. Uh, three represents the Godhead, Trinity. And I had to have Beverly write completeness in there because I got terrible penmanship. Three and a half represents rejection and the dissection of seven. Seven means perfection, but three and a half means rejection. It's, it's half of perfection. Now, what do we mean by that? How many years did Jesus preach before he was rejected? <coughs> three and a half. How many Stephen before he was stoned to death? Three and a half. You look anywhere where somebody was rejected for a ministry and you'll see their ministry lasted three and a half years. You're telling me that all the different people back before computers, back before so many different languages, that these people were able to come up with a numerical system such as this and be perfect through centuries? No. Five represents teaching. What did Jesus do when he was giving the when he was teaching them people and they were hungry? He used five loaves to feed how many? Five thousand. Everybody's afraid afraid of me today because last time I asked somebody to speak up, Carrie did, and I sort of sort of got onto her a little bit, and I really wasn't getting onto her. She told the truth. I told the truth. She stood her ground. I, it, it just fell into that category where water and flour make dough and water and flour make bread. Amen. That was all that was, and I told her that. Six, six represents the worship of man, signifying his rebellion, imperfect, imperfection, works, and disobedience. And that's why we have 666, six, six, three sixes, the imperfection made complete with Satan. Amen? Did y'all ever notice when Solomon was king and his, his kingdom was being built, the richest kingdom, the most powerful kingdom, didn't have to be because God gave him rest all around about from all his enemies, right? Amen? Built the temple had everything going for him and started collecting great wealth. What was the last great wealth he collected? 666 talents of gold. What happened after that? He took on more wives. He started worshiping other gods. Everyone else started worshiping other gods. And the kingdom fell. Why? Because God was telling us that that kingdom and Solomon started putting their trust in the man. Amen? Amen. Uh, seven represents perfection and the sign of God, divine worship, completions, and obedience and rest. So, knowing this, we learn these things from the Old Testament. That's not all we can learn from the Old Testament. What well, we know these things from the Old Testament. So, when we go to Revelation and we hear that Jesus is standing in a room and he's surrounded by seven candlesticks, what does that mean? Well, knowing what we know, that we know that we're the candlesticks, aren't we? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And how did he represent us as the light of the world? A candlestick that should not be put under something, amen? That were to be put on top so that the world can see our light. And he's in the center because he's the center of all the denominations, all Christianity, amen? So we know these things because, we, look, Revelation started in Genesis. And if you want to read, I tell you what, you read Genesis all the way up to Revelation, and when you start reading Revelation, it'll be the easiest book you can understand. Really. It'll be easier than Isaiah, than Samuel, 
It'll be uh, uh, Ezekiel. It'll be, uh, it'll be a whole lot easier to understand the Song of Solomon. Okay? Ecclesiastes, I think that's one of the hardest books in the world to understand. And it seems like everything is just so plain. But it's really not. It's a battle. Ecclesiastes is a battle of a man and the world and God. It's a, it's a daily battle. But I'm going to get into that because we don't have a lot of time and I'm trying to talk fast. Revelation 3. I want you to notice the numbers. We know that 3 is a completeness. He talks to three churches. He introduces himself three times. He does this because he wants you to know that he's not Paul, that he's not John, that he's not Peter. It's Jesus Christ. Okay? And, I, and I'll go through that real quick, but I want to hurry through this. Um, he has three messages, uh, and they are complete messages because of the three. Uh, there are three warnings with three recompenses. Uh, he separates the sinner from the saint by saying that they are from the synagogue of Satan. Uh, the phrase, those of you that have ears, let them hear, that is uh, a warning of importance, that you better listen to what I'm saying. Uh, and the angel, it says, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia. Angel represents messenger. Who is the messenger of your church? Anybody that stands up here and talks, Brother Otis, me, Brother Clifford. I really didn't think about that much until I started getting into Revelation chapter 3. And then it dawned on me the seriousness of my job. I mean, I always knew it was serious, but I mean really serious. One of the things you're going to understand is that um, it's all red letter edition. Jesus knew it would be a red letter edition, but before there was, he wanted to make sure that you knew exactly who was talking. Now this is, I want you to keep this in mind too. This is the end of the first century, okay? 25 years before Nero persecuted Christians. But I want you to tell me if this has anything to do with today, right now. The leaders worship government. The rulers of the, of the government thought that they were gods. The Christians were being persecuted by the government. The government was finding ways to persecute them. Um, the Jews didn't believe that they worshipped the true living God. And there were Christians who fell away from the faith that persecuted the Christians. Does that sound familiar at all about what's going on today? Keeping in mind the things that are happening right now in world government, the things that are going on there. Again, don't be afraid of that. Well, let's go to uh, chapter 3. Let me get a little drink of water. I, I apologize. If my sinuses are kicked up again. Does anybody have any problems with your sinuses besides me? Thank you. God bless you. My doctor told me, because I normally don't have sinus problems in the summer. He said people without sinus problems are, are just, you know, it's really bad right now. Okay. And unto the, unto the angel of the church of Sardis, right, these things saith he, saith he, it has the seven spirits of God. Seven is perfection. That means that Jesus is perf perfectly uh, anointed by the Holy Spirit. Okay? He's introducing himself. And the seven stars, which represents his uh, perfect kingdom and his majesty. I know thy works, and that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore you shall not watch, I will come as a thief, and thou shalt know, not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. What's he saying? There are a few saints that are going to be walking in heaven. Amen? Now, pay attention to this, because we're going to come to that if you have ears. He that overcometh. The same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the church of Philadelphia write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. What did God say? If I say it will be done, no man can say it won't be. If I say it won't be done, no man can say it will be. Who's introducing himself right here again? Jesus Christ. Amen? I know thy works before I have set thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not defied, denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. 
Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Now, who is he speaking to here? Who does Jesus love? And who is he going to have this, those of the synagogue of Satan worship? His saints, amen? Those Christians. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation. Y'all hear that? Don't be afraid. Because when you keep God's word, he's going to keep you from the hour of temptation. Which shall come upon all the world and try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him a new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church of... Help me out there, John. Lendosi. Write these things, saith Amen. Who is Amen? Who said it is finished? Who said it shall be? Jesus Christ. Amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. We know that this is Jesus, don't we? But he wants us to, without a doubt, know this is me talking to all denominations. Remember, these are three churches that represent all denominations, all churches, all around the world. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would work, I would thou work cold or hot. So then because thou art work warm, lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold fire, tried in fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with the eye salve that thou mayest see. What happened when he anointed the man with the eye salve? He gained faith, didn't he? And then he was healed. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in, and I will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit at with me in my throne, even also as I overcame and am set down at my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say unto the churches. The word of God for the people of God. Let's remember what he is saying here. And I'm sure that most of you are, are cluing in on that part where he said, I'll watch your name out of the book of life. That's a serious thing. Let me tell you something. It brings up the question, are you saying that I can be saved and if I don't do certain things, I can still go to hell? James 2.24 says, Ye see now, or you see how, that by works a man is justified and not by faith alone. Hebrews 5.9 And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Do I believe the words of Jesus or do I believe the words of Jesus the way they're arranged by somebody else? Many of years in my life I have spoken with people that said, well, that's not what it means. It means this, this way. But Jesus Christ made it a point to say, I am Jesus Christ and I am speaking to you, the Christian." I will block your name out of the Lamb's book of life if you do not overcome. Should we interpret it that way? Jesus said it. It doesn't matter how I want to interpret it. It's not whether I want to arrange his words. It's whether I want to believe his words. John 17, 3. Listen carefully. And this is eternal life. That they may know that the, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. He is the one I'm going to believe. I'm not going to mix, mix his words. I'm not going to add unto or subtract from because he warned me with a curse, did he not? Jesus could not be any plainer than what he is right here. I've heard people say, well, 
if they were saved and they got worse than they were, I, I know y'all have seen people that got saved, and whether it was a week, a month, a year, or whatever, they were even worse than they were before they got saved. And there's two popular sayings, and one of them is, well, he must have never been saved in the first place. And i got to say, really? Come on. God doesn't fall short of his promises. He says, if you believe and you ask, I've seen people that were, I knew that all they wanted was salvation at that time. And I've seen them a few years later, and they were a different person. God does not fall short of his promises. If they truly wanted salvation, they got it. Um, I'm not going to stand before Christ. And I'm not going to have him look me in the eye and say, why? Did you tell the people there that once they were saved, they had nothing more to do? When I, with my own mouth, told you that there's more to do, I'm not going to be the reason somebody goes to hell. I'm not going to have to look in Jesus' eyes and him say, look, you told them all they were going to lose is a little blessing for me or that they wouldn't get an extra crown when they got here and that they were just out of the will of God well guess what my God your God said that his will was for you to have eternal life amen did not say that that he wants us to have eternal life that none of us perish we all have eternal life so if he's out of God's will then he's what I'm not going to be that person I used to believe that but then I stopped, and I thought, wait a minute. I can take this verse here, and I can take this verse here, and I can say that's what that means, and I can say that's what that means. But when Jesus Christ himself tells me that if I don't overcome, after I've received salvation, that I'm going to go to hell, I'm going to believe Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the later times some shall depart from the faith. What is he saying? You don't fall from grace. No one plucked you out of God's hand. You departed from it. You know, I had a free will before I was saved, and I've still got a free will. You know how I know that? Because since I've been saved, I've sinned. I got saved when I was like 13 years old, and I've sinned like four times. Because I wanted to. God knows I'm joking. That's why I haven't been hit by both of life. Okay? Look. I'm telling you some serious business. Don't forget about the things that are going on in this world. Because I want you to realize that we're more closer to chapter 4 than ever before. And this is the last warning. I mean, Jesus talks about all through Revelation, I'm coming as a thief. Be, be ready, be ready, be ready. But he is speaking expressly to the Christians in the church. And he's saying, you know what, I'm getting tired of going to church. Is Jesus in this church today? Are two or more gathered here today? He said, I'm getting tired of going to church and seeing people that think they know it all, that they got it all, that they can't be taught anything else, and they think they're rich in religion, and they're as poor as can be, and they're detestable in my sight. And I'm telling you, I'll save you, and no one can pluck you out of my hand, and there's no way anyone can take away your salvation, but I've given you a free will to accept me, and that free will is still in you. I know it because I've sinned since I've been saved, and I can walk away from them just not like now, just like I did when I accepted it. Praise God, I got the Holy Spirit, God's promise to keep you doing that. He said, I'll, I'll preserve your salvation unto the end. Amen? They depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Is that not what Jesus just told us in chapter 3? Is that not what he just told the Christian? Don't depart from the faith, or I'll take you out of the Lamb's book of life. Acts 14, 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting unto them. What does it mean when you, when you confirm the souls of the disciples? They made sure that they were saved, Amen. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of heaven. Woo, praise God, this is my last page. Billy, you can open your eyes. I want to read you two verses. 
And there ain't much, I promise. Here, let me show you. Get it on camera. There ain't very much there. I'm going to go back to Revelation. I want to, you know, just sort of give you an idea how my eyes were so open. In Revelation 20, verse 15, it says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Amen? So if your name's not written in the book, you're going to hell. Is that not what it's saying? Can I change them words to mean something else? Sure I can. But would I be stupid to do so? Yes. In Revelation 21, 27, it says, And there shall in no wise enter into anything that is defiled, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or work, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So I guess we can agree that Jesus was telling the truth when he said you must be born again, right? So we know that you have to be saved to get to heaven. And if you have to have your name in that book, then that means when you're saved, your name is put in that book, right? And did Jesus say it or did he not say he would take you out of the book? Brothers and sisters, it's a serious thing to play with God. And you know what? There's a part of me that hopes I'm wrong. I hope that, that, that there are people that get saved and they can live any way they want and still go to heaven. I know it's not true, but I hope that. You know why? Because I know a lot of them. And if nothing else, I hope all the people that I told that to that went ahead and went on and just lived it and moved it up uh, realized how, what I realized when God showed me through the words of Christ that that's not right and that they get right. And in closing, I want to say this. There's a lot of people that will tell you, say, well, you know what? When I become saved, I become the body of Christ. Amen? We're the body of Christ, are we not? So how could we go to hell if we're the body of Christ? Well, do I need to remind you what Jesus said in the eye of Bentley? Pluck it out, because it's better to go into heaven with one eye than hell with two eyes. If a hand offend thee, cut it off, because it's better to go into heaven with one hand than two hands to go to hell. Amen? So if he's telling us we need to pluck an offense off our bodies, what do you think he's going to do for an offense in his body? Y'all see where it's going? You hear the words of Christ? These aren't my words, okay? It can be scary if you're not saved to realize what's going on. This is in the last two years. that the world's largest denominational entity. And at one time, I don't know if it still are, the world's richest landowners, riches beyond compare. You see that? How many of y'all see Indiana Jones? And they show that, that big warehouse full of all these things. It wouldn't surprise me if they didn't have the Ark of the Covenant. Not a, not a bit. Because they have treasures from the beginning of the Catholic Church. Wealthy, powerful, and they already have a, a, a head that is recognized by all denominations. I don't believe that the Pope is the Antichrist. I believe that the Pope is a very loving and kind man and he's searching for the best way for us to get along. But I'm not going to embrace Islam. I have to love them, but I'm not going to be their friend. And I certainly aren't going to respect anyone that doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And there's something wrong with a religion that says that he's a prophet and not the Son of God when he claims to be the Son of God and is a blasphemer if he was not telling the truth. Amen? So, if you have a bad eye, you can come up here and pluck it out. If you have a bad hand, you can come up here and you can cut it off. If I've offended anybody, I'm sorry, because I really do love y'all more than you'll ever know. You know, you hear a lot of preachers say that, and I used to think I just thought of the rhetoric, but I'm telling you, I love y'all very much. You can call me anytime, and I'll, and I'll be there if I can. But I do believe that what I spoke was the truth because I believe Jesus always speaks the truth. And he was speaking to Christians, all denominations, all churches, and saying, look, you know, you're saved. You have the faith. But you better hold on to it. You better do what I tell you to do. What about the builders? Remember, our priests, they both had something in common. Everything was the same except one didn't listen. Our Father God, we thank you so much for this beautiful, beautiful day, God. I thank you so much for giving me the ability to speak your word. God, I, I know that I've ignorant in so many ways. And 
and, and I thank you for the privilege of speaking with your word because I know that that privilege is the Holy Spirit. I know that the Holy Spirit, God, um, reveals things to me as he does everyone in this room. So I've got to give you credit for uh, giving me the strength and, and the wisdom to accept the Holy Spirit when he's speaking to me. I love people, but I can't take it credit for that love. I respect people. I can't take credit for that respect. I can't take credit for the respect and the love that I have for you. If there's any good in me, I cannot take credit for it. For whatever is good in me comes from you. And I'm a lowly, pitiful person without you. And I'll always pray every day that you'll help me to overcome, to hang out. To trust you with everything else. I love you so much. I care about you so much. And these here. And, and I can still hear the words of Jesus. Father, protect them because they are mine. Protect us, God. Go with us and be with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Number 307.